So I understood, okay, I need to do the same as Danaha, not in the scenario of doing the same moves, but understanding where Jiu-Jitsu will go and pick topics that nobody else knows. So I will look at first the rule sets, then the strengths, weaknesses of the potential opponents and of the athletes. So if I have all of this information, this is how I can blend a good plan. So I call the room right now the room of spirit and time. You go in there, one day pass in the real world, but you have one year in the room. So this is how I describe the B-team room if we are all coming together. And I don't know why, but we were like, we can lack Lock Pato. We can lack Lock Pato. <laughs> and everybody was like, yeah, we will lack Lock Pato. And even if I think that Owen could do it, why go with the worst strategy possible. In B-Team, um, we had a house, I call it the athlete's house. Uh, who was it? Someone did a TISM test. A TISM <laughs> test, yeah. A TISM test, and I, and I passed it. <laughs> Dima, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. No, pleasure, thanks for coming over. And when did you arrive in the UK? Uh, let me think a little bit. I think I arrived in Dublin two days ago. Okay. Yesterday I was in Liverpool and today I am in Plymouth and tomorrow I'll be in London. So yeah, pretty busy trip. Wow. Okay. So what's that doing seminars? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So not had much time to kind of enjoy the sights or, or anything then? No, to be fair, I got pretty sick the weekend. Oh no, really? Yeah. Um, the thing is, I think I had at least one seminar every weekend since the B team camp. So I didn't allow myself to get sick because usually what I do in the end of the seminars, I try to roll with everybody. So I'm like, I can't get sick. Then I had one free week, only one where I got my black belt, like the last one. And after I got my black belt, I wanted to celebrate, but I go home and then I feel, that's it. I, I, I felt, I'm like, oh damn, everything is coming together. Yeah, and then I spent three days in bed. <laughs> oh man, so you just got your black belt recently? Yeah, a uh, couple of days ago, Saturday, I think. Oh, congratulations. Oh, you on oh sorry, man, didn't know. Thank you. Congrats. Yeah, so I try to recover while I do the seminars right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. So who did you get that from? Is your uh, coach at the moment? Yeah, my coach is Robert Graves. He's a legend in the Berlin jiu-jitsu scene. Right. Uh, he has an academy for 11 years. And we have a couple of guys in there that had, not had, but were the first, like one of the first black belts in Germany. Christian Kühn, uh, Heiko, and yeah, pretty good in the gi. Okay, amazing. And did you, uh, did you do a speech or did you get whipped? Uh, I never got whipped, uh, luckily. I, I heard a bad story from a friend where <laughs> someone uh, lost sight on one eye. Yeah, because they got whipped oh, in the no, eye. Oh, okay. It was in Brazil. This uh, kind of stuff is not happening in Europe, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Only in Brazil. Got whipped in the eye? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I held a little speech. A okay. Li a little one, like two minutes, three minutes, something like this. Amazing. What sort of stuff did you talk about? Um, just how important the connection between my professor and me was. It's not really the color of the belt that ma made it good. It was the connection and the trust between uh, him and I. And pretty much that it doesn't matter if you're a hobbyist or if you want to be the best coach, the best athlete, whatever. Everybody has his way. And I prefer people to find their own way and not to mimic someone, I think. Keep it real on the mats and in real life, and then you will succeed with whatever you want to do. Yeah, amazing. Well, congratulations again, mate. That's Thank a you. huge achievement. Hey, Grapplers, we are now sponsored by X Marshall. X Marshall have sent us some new quality British design rash guards. These are just the British designs, but they do do loads and loads of really cool designs. You know, they got the OnlyFans ones, they got the Hillbilly ones, they got the Pornhub ones, they got all the all the <laughs> yeah gamer chokes. They got they got all that sort of stuff, which to be honest, you just don't see anywhere else. Yeah, hundred percent. And they also specialize in not just no gi, but also Muay Thai as well. So if you're cross training and you want to pick up some Thai boxing shorts. And uh, that's the place to go as well. Genuinely, really do like them. I think they're uh, they feel really nice. That's what I like about them. They feel really nice. They got the band at the bottom, you know. And uh, yeah, I've took them for a spin, and and they they sweat up quite nicely. And better yet, guys, we've managed to secure a really good discount for our audience. So if you use our link below, then you get an automatic fifteen percent off of everything on their website. Get that up, look, so they can see that shit. Obviously, everybody watching this will know who you are from your work you've done with the B team. 
And we've spoken to Owen, Jay, Ethan at this point, and all of them absolutely sing your praises. So I think there's no doubt that you were very instrumental in that prep for both ADCC and CJI. So we definitely want to talk in detail about your approach to coaching um, and obviously the what you did with those guys at the B team and obviously future plans as well. But we always like to go back you know, to, to kind of the early days with some of the, the, the people that we speak to for the first time. And certainly for my own curiosity, and I think people watching, yeah. be quite curious about, I guess, where you came from, sort of, you know, how you eventually got into martial arts and jiu-jitsu and, and so on. So where did you grow up? Yeah. Uh, so I was born in 93 in Kiev in Ukraine. Okay. So I'm a Ukrainian. And we moved when I was, I think, three or four years old to Germany. So, yeah, I think German, I speak German. That's You hear it in the accent, right? Yeah. It's, it's not Russian, it's, it's German. And I was like, I think I got my first memory that I can think of since I live is Bruce Lee. So <laughs> I, I was born with martial arts and I always felt attracted to it. I was throwing toothpicks as a child because Bruce Lee did it, not toothpicks, but he thrown something else. Ninja in, dart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I was mimicking it and I'm like, I will get all of you, uh, a little three-year-old. Uh, yeah. And then pretty much I grown up in Germany, uh, lived in Leipzig for a long time. And then I moved from Leipzig to Berlin in 2017 to start my jiu-jitsu career. Okay. And it's, it's a long story. I did a little bit of martial arts, like when I was young, because I was a Bruce Lee fan. I was a Jean-Claude Van Damme fan. You, you guys know Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yeah. Like the newer generation will probably think who's, who's that guy. You don't need to watch the movies. I don't think they're too good right now, but it's for us back then it was crazy good, right? It was everything, wasn't it? Yeah. A lot of UFC champions um, started because they watched Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> and yeah. So I was a big fan of this. Did a bit of striking. But to be fair, I got too comfortable in Germany. Because in Ukraine, we didn't have too much. And then we came to Germany. And I got too comfortable that I had a TV. I had my own bed. And then I got... Yeah, I chilled a little bit more. Stopped with the training. Enjoyed martial arts in the form of Dragon Ball Z and other shows. And then when I was a bit older, I understood that, damn, I kind of wasted my youngest, best years not doing martial arts. And yeah, then I thought to myself, what can I do right now and be very good at it? And I think this was when McGregor had his amazing performance against Alvarez. And this was where I was like, okay, I need to do mixed martial arts. So I did a tryout in a Leipzig, uh, like where I lived in a team and striking were pretty smooth because I strike for a couple of years. And then a small guy put me down with a takedown and I couldn't move. And I'm like, okay, I need to be very good at this. And my idea, my original idea was to get uh, one of the best in jiu-jitsu, then go to MMA and then be UFC champion. I was 24 years old when I started with jiu-jitsu, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I was a bit uh, too crazy about that thought, but yeah. Um, then I moved to Berlin because in Leipzig, the guy that had a BJJ Academy, there was only one or two. I wrote him and he didn't respond to me. Then I wrote someone in Berlin. It's two hours away with the car mm -hmm. and he answered me and that was Robert. So I was like, okay, I will move to Berlin. Found a job in Berlin moved there and started training jiu-jitsu. So you literally moved cities to do jiu-jitsu? Yeah. Even though you had not really done it? Yeah. <laughs> <That's> crazy. <laughs> really think about that, that is wild. Yeah. That is actually wild. Yeah, I still have the message. Like, it's it's so crazy because they just didn't answer me. If they would have answered me, I would stay in Leipzig. Yeah. But Robert answered me and he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever, just come to a, a tryout. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I go to Robert and he said it in uh, when he gave me my black belt on Saturday. Uh, the first things that I told him were, my name is Dima, I will be the best in jiu-jitsu, and you will see me every day from now on. And he hears, hears this so many times, like, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah just come. And then after a couple of weeks, we, we bonded, and we had a connection, because I found a job as a fitness trainer, so, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I saw Robert, and he's complaining that he can't get the six-pack, but he's already pretty lean. And I'm like, brother. Uh, sometimes I just say things because I believe in it and I'm not thinking about it too much. That's why some people may not like me, but I told him, bro, you can have a six pack in three weeks. He looks at me. I try to get a six pack for my whole life. I didn't get it. How, what makes you think I can do it in three weeks? I'm like, 
no worries. I, I know a lot about it. And he's like, okay, okay. If you can help me to get a six pack in three weeks, you get as many privates as you want. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> three weeks later, he had a six pack and I had two privates a day with him. Amazing. <laughs> That's pretty cool, man. And, and you said you were a fitness trainer. Yeah. Did you sort of, what sort of qualifications do you need in uh, Germany to do that? I mean, is it a degree or is it like uh, sort of more of a vocational <laughs> professional course that you do like in the UK? Yeah, um, you can have a degree. You can have like we call it fitness trainer A, fitness trainer B. It's like a license that you can do in a, I think a couple of weeks or a couple of months. But for me, it was a little bit different because I was actually a natural powerlifter before I started with jiu-jitsu. So I lifted a bit. I did natural powerlifting. And in order to be great at this, I hired a guy that was like a master sports scientist. And I was so interested in it that I wanted to learn everything that he tried to taught me. So I just picked up the knowledge and this is how I got the job. I just told him about my knowledge, told him uh, about lifestyle, fitness, uh, nutrition. So yeah, I, I was always like this, that I tried to, uh, whatever I want to do, that I learn it myself. Mm -hmm. And this is pretty much how I got the job. And then a couple of months later, I think six to eight months, I was the manager of the gym. So okay. I worked my way up to the manager. <laughs> yeah, good going. And what did you do with your coach to get him a six pack in three weeks? Yeah, it was pretty simple. I just looked at his calories that he consumed, um, the, how much he trains. He, I think he, to maintain what he had, he had to eat three K calories. And then he added some fitness training to it. So we had a deficit of one K calories in a day. We added high protein. And then in the end, just because it has to be quick, I played around with water just so he sees the <laughs> six pack. And then he had the six pack. It was pretty easy. He already um, burned a lot of calories. He just mm -hmm. was eating. Even if you eat less calories, if you're not eating high protein, you may lose weight, but you are not losing it where you want to lose it. Mm -hmm. if you, if you, you guys know what I mean, yeah. right? Yeah. So it was pretty easy for me. Yeah, amazing. And um, with the powerlifting, did you, you see where you were a natural competitor? Yeah. Yeah. And then did you compete at a sort of good standard in Germany when you were doing that? Yeah, uh, I competed, but only in one competition. And I won the German deadlift, something, something like this, but there was not much competition. So this wasn't the, um, the best field of powerlifters. There were two organizations and I think this was the G and something. And I wasn't the greatest powerlifter, just nobody showed up. So that's how I won the title. Like <laughs> not many people were there. Uh, I think my best lifts were deadlift 250, uh, squat 200 kilograms and bench press 150. That's it. It's it's quite good for a normal human being, yeah. but for a powerlifter, uh, it could be way better. Yeah. But I reached my limits pretty fast. Like in the deadlift, for example, I had 230 pretty fast. And then I think it took me one year to get the extra 10 kilograms and then another year to get the other. 10. Okay. And what weight were you? Uh, 93. Okay. It's pretty decent. That's pretty good, mate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. good. And then, and then that mindset that you had, obviously, it sounds like, you know, even even before we get onto the, the coaching and the jiu-jitsu stuff, that a lot of things that you set your mind to, you you know, you're sort of very self-dedicated, become very knowledgeable, you know, and you, you seem to kind of progress quite well. Is, is that a mindset that you've always had, sort of even when you were watching TV and playing computer games or whatever you were doing growing up? Yeah, I, I always enjoy to learn things that I'm interested in and I want to know everything about it. So everything that I can get my hands on to get the information, I will try to search it up. I will try to find it. I will try to ask people about it. I will try everything out, what I read. And yeah, I was always like this. This brings me a lot of joy. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Definitely helpful attribute for jujitsu, I think, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. the tism, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not beating the allegations. Let's say it like that. <laughs> like uh, in B team, um, we had a house. I call it the athlete's house. Uh, who was it? Someone did a tism test. A tism <laughs> test. A, yeah. a tism test, and I and I passed it. <laughs> Let's put it like this. And I don't know. Did Owen tell the story with the bag? Uh, I don't think so. He no. did refer to a house, but he certainly did not call it an athlete house. He called it something else, quite derogatory. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's probably the same place. Like, uh, searched up somewhere on maybe the next time you can talk about this, there's a story about a bag and me. Okay, I will not tell more about this because <laughs> I can't tell the story. Are you saying, what are you saying, a bag? Or a a bag? bag, yeah, a, a bag where you can put things in okay. after you buy stuff. Like, right. um, 
and yeah let's let's put it in this way like short story i was looking at the back and i had difficulties to just grab it just because it was i i don't know what it was but it looked like i couldn't grab it uh, and they are looking at me he and joseph they are just looking at me for like two minutes and finally i have it and i'm i'm happy that i got it and they're like bro <laughs> you're so autistic <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> Mate, jiu-jitsu is a, is a tism company. Yeah, you're in, good, you're in good company, mate, so I wouldn't worry about yeah. it. All right, so you, you've now acquired these private sessions with your coach. So two, two, do you say two a week? No, two a day. Two a day, okay. Um, so obviously quite a commitment of time from your coach. So fair play to him for yeah, honoring that. he really that. wanted that six-pack, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he hated me. He, he, he hated me. He told me every day I hate you because I made him wake up before the first session. So this is my this was my typical day. I think this is interesting. Um, don't copy it. It was stupid. Uh, I just didn't know what to do in the beginning. So the first session would be around eight, eight a.m. night a.m. Yeah. And I always go to sleep at two, three, or four. So I didn't get much sleep, but I was in my mid twenties, so it was okay. Uh, we are doing the private session one hour before it starts. Then we have the normal session. Then I run to my job pretend to work, run back, try to make the um, delay two to three sessions, and then I try to drill afterwards with him. So this would be a typical day. And yeah, he hated it. He hated it. One time I made him wake up at four because I had to travel to Munich, another place. So I woke him up at four, we drilled, and then I go to Munich and come back the next day. <laughs> okay, how did he not just say, fuck off? <laughs> I don't know. I, I would definitely tell me to fuck off, but thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot. No, he also enjoyed it. It was a great time, to be fair. Like, we had, we had a lot of fun because in the beginning, the privates were like, he shows me the basics. He was mm -hmm. a big Hodger Gracie fan, and he got the black belt from Nick Brooks. And Nick Brooks got his, I think, first black belt stripe or something like this, or the second one, or the third, I don't know. He was like a five degree black belt or whatever from Hodja Gracie so they were correlated and Robert lost the close guard is a very gifted close guard player and he teached me very good basics from the beginning but after a couple of months I brought the stuff that we were drilling on because I watched Denaha back then not many people watched Denaha in the UK he didn't have the DVD back then so I would try to analyze their matches and then I would bring the stuff and then we would drill it and this is how he also improved in Logi yeah so you was like helping each other at that point so you were coming and doing it all and exactly and he was like getting something out of it it's pretty yeah. cool this is why i value the black belt so much because it comes from him he was the only one that was believing in me a lot of people were shaming me would say it's stupid what you do like were bullying me a little bit but i don't care like i i never cared about this but uh he was always behind me and this is the black belt mindset that i want to have to think like a white belt. He was listening to a loud little fucker that does jiu-jitsu for a couple of weeks. So if he can do it and we learn something out of it, I also want to do it. This is why I try to be open-minded to everything. Like there out there are white belts that are more talented and better in certain positions than maybe even the best people in the world. They just need to find the position that suits them. And this is why I always like to um, help people to find their own way and find their own talents and not try to mimic someone. Yeah, yeah. no, it's good. It's definitely a good approach, I think. And what's the uh, what was the, the jiu-jitsu scene like in Germany at this point? Was there a lot of competitions? Were there a lot of training partners? Um, when I, you mean 217 to 18 when I started? Yeah. yeah. Um, so nobody trained no gi. Okay. I only trained gi. I just did no gi and gi pretty much. And we had a competition, me and Robert, every month so we did a competition every month and i think i did my first competition after two or three months of training and pretty much um the training partners all gi all good i wasn't that good back then so it doesn't matter too much um but it was a fun experience that we were traveling together to all the competitions i sucked at white belt i was so bad at white belt like i i got some silver medals and ibgjf events and whatever mm -hmm. but i wasn't really good and then in blue belt, everything came together. And I won every tournament there except of two where I got second. So, yeah, we had enough training partners for the current level or not current the level there. And we definitely had enough um, 
motivation to travel the world for tournaments. Mm -hmm. And what was your uh, what was your style? So when everything clicked, what was your kind of A game to victory at that point? Footlock. Was it? <laughs> Footlock. And um, I did two, I think, Nogi tournaments. I didn't do more when I was a blue belt against uh, higher belts. And there I used Helox. Like this was after the leg lock system was released. And then it was pretty much... Um, single leg x to cross ashi to he look like mm -hmm. classic today classic. classic back then it nobody knew of it or not many people uh tried it out in europe yeah and did you compete any of the uh the sort of the, the big sort of european or or sort of worlds uh tournaments yeah uh the, no the only tournaments that we competed in or that i competed in were like in europe and it was i think ibgjf tournament agf uh grappling industries stuff like that yeah. not more and then uh, I wanted to do worlds and Europeans, but this is where I got injured pretty bad. And yeah, long story short, I will not talk too much about it. But when I felt that everything's coming together, I was a pretty solid blue belt in Europe, like going against higher belts and doing the, all the stuff because nobody was doing the dinner stuff back then. Um, I was feeling pretty good. And after I won, I think, Grappling Industries in Amsterdam, I think... Um, yeah, a couple of days after this, I was training with a training partner, Fabi Benz, and he was one of the best in Germany at this time. He also traveled to Artos, trained with the guys there, was preparing himself for worlds, everything. It was pretty good. Uh, you can also see him training with the Rotolos and Flow Grappling. Um, and yeah, we rolled and he put me in an electric chair and I didn't know what it was. I, I was a blue belt. It's illegal. Don't do it. No, just kidding. And then, because I didn't feel it in my knee, I didn't even know that it goes to the knee, uh, it popped. And the ACL was gone. Meniscus was gone. Tibia was a little bit broken. And I just look at him. Mm, everything is fine. Everything is fine. So I continue to roll with him. I continue to roll with other people for one and a half hours. Have the best training session ever. I feel like, okay, I will beat everybody in the coming weeks, months. Yeah, and then I was out for two years. Oh, mate. Funny, funny thing. Funny thing, the guy that did it to me, again, it's not his fault, like I, I could just tap if I wouldn't be that stupid. Uh, he got his ACL torn out with an electric chair when he was a blue belt. <laughs> oh, mate. I looked at him then because he did a, <laughs> the day he got his blue belt, he did a white belt into club, put some big lump in an electric chair and busted his ACL as well. <laughs> <laughs> when you say that, I was like, oh, fuck it up. <laughs> I feel bad though. I didn't mean like I didn't mean to, do I? No, no. But that's the thing. I think, like you say, a lot of people don't realise that because you because you feel the groin stretch. It's a groin stretch, isn't it? But the thing is, is people think oh, I can I can hold the groin stretch, which I can, but it's the rotation of the knee that, yeah. that eventually goes. That's what it is. Yeah. But there's a couple of times where uh, in training I never do it. I never do it to any any anymore. No, yeah. When I first was <laughs> practicing it, but I would still wouldn't put it on hard. No, because yeah, it's just a shit shit move if if they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So so you're out for two years because normally an ACL is, is about nine months. So why so long? So again, the guy that taught told me that he did it without a surgery. And um, actually, he was one of the most stable in the study. He did a study with the Charité and it's um, like a um, hospital. And he was more stable than the people that had surgery. So I was pretty confident and I can do the same. So I was going to his physical therapist and actually after two months I could sprint again. Um, but I couldn't do jiu-jitsu because of the rotational movement. Mm. So after four or five months, I feel like I can come back. I go in a deep squat, pop, Men the meniscus is torn completely, bucket handle tear. I'm like, okay, now I need the surgery. So four to five months gone. Then I wanted to get the surgery with one of the best surgeons in Berlin. And I found one that is like a president of a knee association. So he is very well known. I waited two to three more months to get the appointment. Got the appointment. I wake up after the surgery and I know how an ACL needs to look like or the leg, how it needs to look like because I also was in the fitness inter uh, industry. And it was pretty bad. I wake up, he fucked something up. I, I can show you a picture. It looks gross. It looks gross. Uh, and yeah, they told me everything is fine. I couldn't walk. I couldn't walk for one year. I, it was more limping. And I told them that I have scar tissue in there because 
I like to research things. So I start to research what could be the problem, stuff like that. I try to analyze how I could read an MRI. I can't, but I could definitely see the scar tissue. So we did two more MRIs. They told me there's nothing. I, I can clearly see that I have scar tissue in there. So then one year later, I find a friend and he has another doctor. And the other doctor is also not believing me because everybody knows of the guy that did the surgery on me. He's pretty good. But I still convinced him to open it up. And he's like, but don't be, don't be mad or sad if I find nothing. I'm like, okay. I wake up after the second surgery. They're like, Dima, you had such a big scar in there, scar tissue. So they uh, cut it out. And after that, I could train again. So after two years. Man, I see it. Everybody's human. They, people make mistakes, even the best. Everybody can make mistakes. Yeah. But that, that's shit, man. And, and really unfortunate. And, you know, I, I've got sore ribs at the moment. I've not been able to train for about four weeks. And you know, I've been sulking and, and eating junk food. And, and you know, my head's not been in a good space. So, like, where were you at for that, for that period, like, not being able to train? You can ask the people around me. It was the darkest time of my life. It was pretty dark. Because as many of us, I used jujitsu as a tool to get away from real life, right? Like jujitsu, I'm not doing it because um, it's hard to do and I want to do something hard. It's because it makes life easier for me because I can focus on something that I really enjoy. So I spent the two years focusing on jujitsu a lot. I watched everything that was out there, but still, if you can do it, you will eat junk food. You will not move. I got so fat. I got so (laughs) fat and I was very depressed. Like it wasn't a good time. At one point of time, I was so crazy in my head. I told um, my uh, girlfriend at this time and my friends that I want to amputate the leg so I can roll. Because if I don't have the leg, I can roll again. I consider this. Yeah, I I was serious after two years because nobody could tell me what it was. And uh, I was considering it. That's how crazy I was. Luckily, I didn't do it. I can imagine I wouldn't do it, hopefully. But the people that saw me at my worst know how bad it was. Mm. So four weeks is nothing. Enjoy the four weeks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I know from my studies as well, I, I did uh, an exercise rehabilitation degree and we covered a, a sort of injury psychology module. So I know that, that, that you know, when, when athletes get injured, like the, the sort of the grief response cycle that you can go through. And it, yeah. it's, it's like- It's nothing a, worse than being injured. No, it's like a period of mourning and Danny's had like like long injuries and this is a brief injury. I've had longer injuries as well, but, but two years for somebody who's so like, all in on something it must have been really tough how about your work were you even able to work with like the struggling with walking no um so the funny thing is one month before the injury i agreed that i will switch my job from the normal gym to the academy where i trained so i should be the the manager for robert's bjj academy uh, and the name is bjj academy in berlin <laughs> <laughs> so i could continue to work in the first four months where i didn't have the surgery but after the surgery, it was so bad. Like the, the craziest thing is that the doctors didn't believe me. They're like, you're, you're not doing enough uh, rehab. Bro, I did rehab every day, the whole day. I did it the whole day. I was at the point where I was thinking I do too much rehab. Then I stopped doing rehab and it's the same. When you say you could see it was a mess, what are you talking the scar or the, the, the direction of the, the knee? Like what, what, are you, what are you seeing? The whole leg was purple. I couldn't, I couldn't feel it. I couldn't lift it. Usually after ACL surgery, after um, like a couple of hours, you should be able to lift your leg and move it a little bit. I couldn't lift it. It was it was dead. And it was way bigger than the other leg and the colors were changing. And I felt very, very weak. I, I, I was, uh, my skin is very light, but I was even lighter. I, I felt like there's something... Um, they cut into something and I'm bleeding. That's how it was feeling like. Yeah, I've, I've had a few friends from football who've had ACL injuries and they, they had pretty good recoveries, really. Yeah. Like, no no real issues. So you yeah, definitely had proper, real problems with it being completely different colours and swelling like that. They, I, don't, I don't know how they didn't pick that, like, say that, how, how they would say that's fine. It, it was crazy. I, I believe it was one in a million. Like, the, the, the ACL that he did is perfect. He, he put it in perfect. It's just the injury that he didn't address. And if you are one of the best in the world, and again, why would you listen to me? There's an ego, right? Yeah, why (laughs) would you listen to me? If Robert would be the dog, he would probably listen to me, looked into it, removed the scar tissue, or look where he injured me, and then everything would be fine. But in the end, everything is good how it is, because Mm. who knows where I would be right now if this wouldn't happen. 
Yeah. And, and this is it. I think, you know, obviously it was a dark period for you, but you, you said that you had obviously the opportunity because you weren't on the mats to do a lot of studying. And there's obviously a lot of strength in that itself. And I guess thinking back, you know, just trying to think about the silver lining, you know, do you think that period did give you maybe an insight to, to certain aspects of jujitsu that you might not have had if you were on the mats not looking at that stuff? 100%. 100%. It, it changed everything. And even after that, it, it, felt for, it felt like for me that the universe, I, I'm not believing in any religion or whatever, but it felt like the universe is giving me signs every time when I try to come back and compete. I got the random injury. Like this was already pretty crazy that I had to recover two years for this. But there was another point after I trained in B team for I think uh, in total six months in a year or four months, five months, something like this. Uh, I was ready to compete again and I stood up and I tore my belly button like I had a hernia just from standing up. Another instance, it, it's still torn by the way. Uh, Another instance, I framed on the guy after I had the surgery on the hernia. It turned up again, but it doesn't matter. Um, I framed on the guy and he switched left to right. And then I tore four of my ligaments in my hand just because he switched left to right. And this is where I discovered the high body lock, by the way. Uh, high body lock, very good move. Um, yeah, and every time I stop thinking about competing and focus on being a coach, everything is fine. I could train as much as I want. I could go into the worst situations no injury nothing so it feels like my way is the way of a coach at least for right now and every time i commit to it good things happen to me every time i try to be an athlete or i try to test my ego and prove to everybody i'm not bad in jiu-jitsu i'm actually good something bad is happening mm. yeah interesting maybe a bit of a calling then as you say so you got back to jiu-jitsu after two years um you know, when did you start making that, that sort of transition or lean towards more coaching? So when I came back, I immediately trained for one month, booked my ticket to B-team, 22 January, and trained there for three months because in my mind still, I want to be the best. So I go there and I have success against people that are not from B-team. And then I roll with good guys from B-team and I understand that they fucked me up completely. Why? Because I use their stuff. So at this point of time, I was still very big into instructionals and everything. But this is where I understood if I play their game, I can never beat them. I can only beat the people that are not playing the game. But I, I came back and everybody was doing Denaha stuff, right? When I, when I was there in 219, nobody did it. Then I came back in 21 and everybody was doing it. So I understood, okay, I need to do the same as Denaha, not in the scenario of doing the same moves, but understanding where jiu-jitsu will go and pick topics that nobody else knows so then i started to experiment with low singles for ex that's only an example like i did a lot of things but instead of focusing on instructionals i focused on developing my own systems looking into dagestani wrestling looking into american wrestling into judo all the stuff mma and then developing a system that i could use and then i go back to b team and i had more success than in the beginning still not great but better than in the beginning and this is where I understood, okay, I need to develop my own systems and I need to move on from there. And the good thing is that by this time, the knowledge that I acquired came into my body because I couldn't train, right? So I had the knowledge, but it wasn't still in my body. And now I'm at the point where I feel like everything is coming together. So I feel pretty confident and it's easier than ever to come up with good ideas for the future. And I'm very thankful for this. And this only worked out because I was a B team and I met the right people at the right time. So I'm now able to have a room like um, the best people had a couple of years ago in Hensos. Okay. And if you have a room like this, everything is easier. The progress is ridiculous. Everybody in the B team camp, me included, not only the athletes, also the coach, the people that came out of the camp are not the people that came in. It's like everybody improved drastically and everybody was the best version, version of themselves. Even people that already were in the highest levels, like Nicky Rod, He was already great, right? But you saw what he did in CGI. Even if you uh, can argue that this wasn't the best competition ever, 
when did you see Nicky Rod finish everyone in this matter? This is the best Nicky Rod ever. And I would be confident against everybody that he goes uh, in, that he would look very, very dominant. So I hope in the future that we can see very good matchups against people like Nicky Rod. Mm. Okay. So you, you first went to B team in 20, that would have been 2020, 2021? 22. 22. 22, okay. January to April. Okay, fine. And then obviously you went in as the as the coach for the, that particular camp, as you just said. How did that happen? In 24, you mean then? Yes, the recent one, yeah. yeah. Okay, that, that's another story. I tried to piece it up together so it's not too long. Um, so my last attempt on being an athlete was for the trials in 23. In, I think, September. So I was going to Jason Rouse with my student Linus and we wanted to do the camp there with Joseph together. And we did the camp. I didn't train before this because I had the hand injury that we spoke about. And I was naive enough to think that even if I'm not training, I can perform good. So we are at Rouse and I train for about two to three weeks. And I can I have the opportunity to get the match against uh, his name is even even levy uh, he's a pretty solid black belt he's the brother of amanda levy and he trains under dana right now so he's really good and i was like okay i will just go against him without real training with my injury i don't care i, I need to be prepared for adcc trials so no excuses i go out and when i was at the mat i already gassed out because i was so uh, not only unconfident but also uncomfortable and i performed the worst He's still better than me. Uh, he was still better than me this day. <clears throat> so I don't want to say that he wouldn't beat me or whatever. It's just about me and my idea of how I should perform. And this is where I understood, okay, if you can't train like you should train, because I have a clear vision of athletes, how they should train, how can I think that I can compete at the highest level? I can't at this point of time. So <clears throat> at the same time, Joseph came up to me because he told me he liked what I do with Linus and he asked me if I could help him with coaching and i'm like perfect timing everything is coming together right so i concentrated the rest of the camp on preparing joseph and you don't need to prepare him technically too much because he is one of the best techniques in the world um but he still lagged in the engagement phase or he lagged in not getting into the engagement phase so we trained and we practiced a lot of um being a bit at the distance, deciding when you have to go in. We pushed a bit uh, his cardio level with positional rounds, stuff like that, like pretty simple stuff. I think I already talked about it. And his performance was amazing. So again, everything came together. And after that, my coaching career sort of started. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about that, that camp at B team then. So the yep. ADCC CGI camp. Um, so obviously you're going into a room, like you said, it was an amazing room. Yeah. Um, so you've got like a, a like a, an amazing opportunity to work with amazing athletes who are already at a good standard. But obviously there's a, for, for many people, there would be a degree of intimidation maybe walking into that room. Some big personalities there, you know, obviously people that are technically at a very high standard. I mean, what was it like sort of when that opportunity came up? Were there any doubts in your mind about whether you should take it or not? And what was it like when you first walked in there and said, hi guys, I'm here to coach you? So the good thing is I knew them already from my training sessions yeah. in 22. And I had no doubts in my mind about me because I'm very confident with my concepts, with my understanding of jiu-jitsu, with my techniques. I'm very confident with it. And I don't think my, many people spend as much time on it as I do. I'm obsessed with it. I, I can stand behind it what I do. Like, I, I believe in this. So the only issue was if they would believe in me. This is the only issue that I had. And it was how I got to the job. Um, I would prepare Joseph regardless, right? And I would also prepare Margot regardless because she also asked me. I worked with her. She won trials. But with her, it was a, um, a different story because with her, we needed to add the right skill set. So, for example, you saw her wrestling in the finals of ADCC trials and she took down her partner three times. So she became a wrestler after six weeks. It was a six-week camp okay so a lot is possible skill wise performance wise concept wise everything and i wanted to prepare them regardless so i would be at b team yeah regardless and then seth approached me um seth is the owner of b team he's the co-owner of craig and he was like dima 
what should we do so you prepare all of us? And I'm like, say no more. Of course, I love the B team. I love all of these guys. Um, and this is why I started to prepare the game plan for the camp. And it took me about one to two months to have it finalized. And yeah, then I was there. In the beginning, it was a bit odd. Like, obviously, it's a bit odd. You have the highest level people in there and a random guy comes in. Um, but the biggest thing that I had is the trust from Joseph. So again, without Joseph, I wouldn't be anywhere. So I love this kid, not only as a coach-athlete relationship, also as a friend, way more than a, uh, as a friend. Because I coach him like two times in a year when he has big competitions coming up, but we are always friends. So his trust was pretty big for the trust of the guys and the first training sessions. So the first training sessions, they understood uh, my ideas. They see that it worked, especially with Jay. I prepared them for the Tynan match and we only had a couple of days. And only in the couple of days, we already made a lot of progress in what I call rumble passing, just so he's not getting entangled. And even though he lost, he looked amazing. So yeah, and this gained a bit of trust. And after that, everybody was happy and everybody was trusting me and everybody would come not late anymore into the practices. <laughs> People would drill the techniques that I show. I showed about like two techniques every day. Uh, you can see it on my Patreon. I posted the whole camp there. And yeah, it was pretty easy afterwards. Okay. So there was no, there was no like pushback from any of the, uh, any of the athletes or anything? Not at all. Who was you worried about getting on side? Was you worried about anyone in particular getting them like to follow you? Not really. It's it just about the trust thing because if one guy is not trusting me and one guy is thinking that I'm not showing the right stuff. I don't have any clue. It would spread like a virus. Yeah. And I don't want this picture. Uh, so they have the picture of me. So everybody had to be on board. And luckily, everybody that I work with is always on board. I never had someone that didn't like what I do. I had people from the outside that are not liking what I do, but they don't even know what I do. Yeah, they saw they've seen a little snippet of, yeah. of something. They never rolled with me. Or maybe they rolled with me in 22 when I sucked. But again, though, we, we spoke about this earlier. There's, there's sometimes there's a big difference between like athlete and coach and how people can portray information, how people can, you know, you know you're super dedicated to what you do. So yeah. someone like Nicky Rod, who's a, an amazing ap athlete and he's smashing everyone now, but he may not be able to get across the same information. And he doesn't want to dedicate his time as well. He probably never will dedicate his time to do what you've done to learn those, those nuances. Yeah, yeah, totally. Exactly. That, that's a difference between coach and athlete. That is, that is. And that's it, it, all the time. It doesn't mean that every athlete in the world is going to be a great coach. You see it all the time in loads of different sports. They're great athletes and they go into management and they're dog shit. They're absolutely dog shit because it's a different skill set. Mm. Being a coach and, and being uh, really good with people and motivating people, it's not just about how good you are as a jiu-jitsu guy. You know, you, like you said before, you were going there and they were beating you. But that doesn't mean that you can't you know, improve and then pass on information that they don't know because it's, there's so many factors in there to jujitsu. Yeah. Two things. Number one, if someone is not good in jujitsu, but he pretends to be good, you will see it on the mat. You will feel it. So I rolled with most of the guys and everybody is on board with me being a coach. So that means I can't be too bad. Right. And number two, what is the, goal of the coach or what does a, have a coach or like what has a coach to do to be good improving the athletes in the shortest amount of time possible with the best skill set possible okay so you want to improve them as fast as possible and as good as possible this is the idea of a coach the idea of an athlete is to win on the mat that's it the idea of a good jujitsu grappler is not even to win on the mat it's being skilled Okay, we have a lot of skilled people. We have a lot of people that are champions, but maybe they are not as skilled as certain people in certain gyms. Okay, so we have, I distinguish uh, this between technicians, athletes, and innovators always. There are different types of people, and there are also different goals. So as a coach, ask yourself if you can improve the athletes faster than the world champion can. If so, why should the world champion be the coach and not the coach that can improve people better and faster than everybody else? Like, that's the idea that we need to get. But but it's okay. 
it's good to be skeptical. It's always good because we can trust everybody. And yeah, again, in the end, I'm pretty happy how it worked out. I love the people in B-Team. We have a connection now. And if I'm there, we know the roles. I'm, I'm the head coach if I'm there. And the roles are clear. After the practice, we make fun of each other. <laughs> I'm a no one anymore. Like <laughs> the moment we get back to the house, I, uh, people harass me again. Oh, and Joseph, whatever. But um, this is, I think, something that is special about us. We are not too strict. And I think you can be too strict in B-team. As long as we understand our roles and everybody is listening to what needs to be done. Like if we end the practice and I tell you to go to Joseph and do a mount round with him, doesn't matter what you think about me outside the mat, you do it. And this is where we understand the roles. If I tell five guys to go to Nicky Rod and spar him one after the other, they need to do it. Okay, Nicky Rod needs to do it. Everybody needs to do it. And I think we established this. So yeah, pretty happy about it. Yeah. You said you obviously when you got the opportunity, you you'd spent some time thinking about your program and your approach to the camp. I'm really interested to hear about kind of what that design was like because jiu-jitsu again is like a unique thing and I think a jiu-jitsu coach certainly in your perspective is quite unique because like you said you're working with athletes and not just sort of um, you know tacticians or technicians sorry um, so you when you think about normal athletes and you're a I don't know a strength and conditioning coach for example you think about maybe just a, a general readiness block and then you get into a strength block start converting that into power and then you start obviously peaking working towards like an event but then often you would work in a multidisciplinary team so you'd have the S&C coach or the, the fitness or strength coach doing that stuff. And then alongside that, you'd maybe have the skills coach developing the skill. You'd have a nutritionist. So as a, a jiu-jitsu practitioner, as a fitness coach, it kind of sounds like maybe you got involved with many of those aspects. So I'm interested to, to understand what that, what that camp would have looked like in regard to the various components of periodization and also the ver various components of the types of training as well. So I distinguish jiu-jitsu training um, structure in two phases, performance and skill development. In performance, we don't have too much time to add a lot of skills, but sometimes we need to add some skills. So in order to understand what we have to do, because this was a performance phase, we are in front of CJI and ADCC, two of the biggest events ever. So we need to perform. So I will look at first the rule sets, then the strengths, weaknesses of the future opponents, potential opponents, and of the athletes. So if I have all of this information, this is how I can blend a good plan. Performance, I like to do it around 8 to 10 weeks because it's a hard camp. I like to have one deload week in the middle. So we peak a little bit, have a deload week, and then we peak again a bit harder. I know who needs to learn what or who needs to improve on what. For example, Jay. I will stick with Jay because he was here on the podcast. And also Ethan, we can also talk about Ethan. Both of them had the issue that they would go into entanglements. So we need to look at the engagement phase and we need to look how to understand how to approach it before you oppose your will. So staying safe first, controlling the left hand, controlling the right side by having your V grip on the armpit or the hip, like stuff like that. And this is where I understand, okay, I need to show these techniques uh, I have a split squat system like almost every coach. It's different in some ways. It's similar in others. And what I try to do also with my systems, I grab it from the best people in the world. I don't have one guy where I can uh, get everything. For example, split squat passing. Gordon Ryan is amazing for it for concave and convexing. So if you're already past the engagement phase. Dante Leon is really good in the engagement phase. So he's good for what I call hip camping when you're upright, okay, with the route racks and everything. Then you have phases where you need to solidify the pass. Then you have phases where you need to um, maybe go back, stuff like that. So we have different high-level people in the world that do good stuff. My job is to understand what's the best for this person. So my knowledge has to be very deep. It has to be. And if I don't have the knowledge, I need to acquire the knowledge. So... For coaches, my tip is not to know everything, but you need to know how to acquire the knowledge of everything. And this is how you can be a great problem solver. And the more and more you will do it, the easier it will be in live training. So if anyone asked me, what can I do there? 
you will just feel it because you understand the concepts. You have so much knowledge of the concepts rather than the techniques. And then it's like the progression is faster and faster. So this is how we have the techniques only for these two individuals, but we have more individuals, right? So I need to blend the techniques into the different weeks. And then in order to solidify that they are working on it, I can show the same technique every week. I need to create tools or in the ecological approach, I think they call it games. And the specific games have to be there for the skills that we need to sharpen or develop for the weaknesses and strengths that we have. I hope it's understandable what I say because uh, this is my thought process when I go into programming a camp. I will not show more than two techniques a day. And these two techniques are just supporting the concepts that I want to bring to the athletes that they need to win in the tournament because it's performance. So it's not about getting the best skill. They already have skill sets. My thing in performance is to give them the skills to make the skills that they already have better or to make them not vulnerable to their weaknesses. And for example, rumble passing is one of the best systems for passing. This is why Jay used this. Okay, great. Good answer. Good detail. That was amazing. I ain't going to lie. I'm like, that is fucking one so, so Owen, who we spoke to earlier, said one of the things that you were amazing at is exactly what you just said, where you were great at identifying the weaknesses of the individuals. So working one-to-one, -one, it's quite easy to start thinking about the, the techniques that you need to fill those gaps. Obviously, when you've got a room of people, all with different strengths and weaknesses, and you're delivering group exercise or group coaching, how did you manage that? So this is one of the toughest things as an instructor. As a coach, you have to be an, you have to be an instructor. A lot of people look at instructors and they say they are great coaches. Different things. Mm -hmm. Okay. But as a coach, in my opinion, at this state, we need to be great instructors. This is one of the biggest things that we need to have as coaches. And because you have so many people you can sometimes blend skills in one technique but you're not doing it with the technique you're doing it with what you tell around the technique so it doesn't matter if you're in the skill development phase or in the performance phase i cover the concepts in techniques so it's like a charade that i play okay all the techniques are only there to get you to the concept and sometimes one concept can help two different people with two different problems with two different techniques because it's the same concept especially if it's like top and bottom, okay? So if I teach you from top how to win the hand fight, how to impose your will with head position, you will also learn it from the bottom. But I can charade it that it's only for the top person, okay? But the concept is for both. So this is how I try to blend everything together. And it's a hard job. It's, it's not easy. This is probably one of the hardest things that you have to do as an instructor if you want everybody in the room to succeed. And how much time outside of practice were you going away and sort of researching and, and coming up with plans and, and uh, solutions to problems? Lucky thing about me is I'm not sleeping at night. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I would say before that, before the camp, because I have a lot of time to prepare everything. Easy 10 to 14 hours a day. <laughs> easy like that's all i do that's i'm on the mat or i'm at home and i'm researching things like that's all i do now i i'm not doing as much anymore just because i'm still burnt out from the camp <laughs> and i still have to do other things i have a system that i develop right now for the next camp so i need to focus on this and at the camp i would say every night about four to six hours because when everybody is sleeping already i'm still awake and this is where i can look at the tape um, in B team, we can look at the matches. I can look at what I think might make sense. I can think about uh, a lot of stuff there. Mm -hmm. So this is the timetable that I would say I used. But now it's way less. Right now, I'm really chilling with it. Yeah, yeah. I think you probably need to undulate your uh, intensity around learning yeah. and, and planning, right? Yeah. And obviously, there, there's a lot of talk there around the sort of concepts and techniques and the skill um, and developing you know, strengths and closing weaknesses. How about priming the body? Did you um, do much around strength and conditioning and nutrition and that type of thing? So I try to stick to the jiu-jitsu when I do it, but I make sure that everybody knows that they have to do a little bit of strength on the outside. Strength is very important, like in the highest levels. There's a big difference if you grapple a guy that is not training in the gym and a guy that is training in the gym especially if they take some steroids then you feel it even more right so strength is a big thing and it can protect you 
Not too much. You have to understand if someone cannibalizes into you, your ligaments will not be as strong just because you squat 200 pounds. Okay, but it still protects you, uh, kilograms. It still protects you, and especially in the performance camp, we are going down with the strength and conditioning stuff just because the training is so hard. Most people don't know this, but we only trained five to six times in the week because the training was so hard. Uh, we have sessions where we roll easy and drill a lot, two to three hour sessions at night that I'm not counting into it. But the closer we get to competition, to the competition, the less we want to train because the intensity is just that high. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the actual practices themselves. Um, so you've kind of alluded to a couple of bits, but what would, it sounds like you probably had a couple of different approaches to practice, but what would they, what would they typically look like in regard to the structure of, of what you were doing? So... The structure is more or less the same. It's the, it just changes what I do in the structure. So in the beginning, we need to warm up. So I use tools that I call base, for example. Base is where um, you can call it positional sparring. I just call it like this so we all know what we do. Um, the lower partner can pick an entanglement and the top partner has a goal. The goal is, for example, you try to stay in there and impose your will instead of getting out. Okay, We can change the goal, whatever. And then we just switch it up. We do it in a low heart rate. Why low heart rate? Because then the risk of injuries low. You're warming yourself up and you can learn a lot. Because low heart rate just means you can think. Okay. If you're in the higher heart rates, you're not thinking. Think about someone in university. You can have all the skill, but then you still mess up the test because your heart rate is high and you can't think. And then we hire the heart rate. For example, the next tool can be height. Okay. I will not explain what it is, but height is a tool that we can do in medium heart rate okay and then we have two tools we have 10 to 20 minutes of warming up sparring where we maybe learn something already and then we have the technique part so we do some technique and then we do a bit of positional sparring and then we do normal sparring in the skill development phase we add a lot of talking to it so i like to have a q and a after every practice with everyone so we can discuss everything and think about what we did so much information this is great it's a really good insight that's yeah. what i really enjoyed about it it's, it's yeah it's fascinating yeah no it's good and from a nutrition perspective did you um support the guys in regard to making sure that they were obviously sitting at the right weight that they need to be to compete and make weight and also to fuel their fuel their sessions yeah, the thing is, I was living with them in the house. Okay. So I got this question a lot. Can I eat this? Can I eat yeah. that? Can I do this? Can I do that? I cooked for them a little bit. Like <laughs> for Joseph, like I need to cook for him a little bit in the later phase. So he's stopped thinking. Okay. I want him to just focus on being there, like being there present uh, in the present and uh, just competing. So I will do stuff like this, but I'm not their nutritional coach. I'm not their strength and conditioning coach. I'm just supporting like like a mom or something like this. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> the closer it gets to the competition. Yeah, no, that's brilliant, mate. And when you think about the, all the different athletes in the room, I mean, Owen sort of offered his view earlier on who he thought improved the most. But for you thinking back to that period, like who did you, who do you think really kind of excelled during that period that you were doing the camp? I would say the Rod Brothers for sure, because they are real athletes. Yeah. And if real athletes have a real coach, this is where the magic begins because they are listening. They're, they are not questioning anything. I say something, they do it. I could tell them, get me a Pepsi. They would just go and get me a Pepsi. They wouldn't think about it. And they enjoy hard training. So I think this was a pretty big thing. Own them. Own. The thing is, we needed to add a skill in the standing position, the overhook. We were already talking about it. But man, he did crazy stuff in the room. He is an innovator. That's how I call him. I don't know many innovators in jiu-jitsu, but Owen Jones is definitely one of them. And just because of him, I'm developing a system right now, and I think this is the best, I can't say too much, but one of the best submissions that I ever uh, saw. And I'm building a system around it just because he did it out of nothing in the camp against someone really, really good, someone that never taps to leg locks. And yeah, then we started thinking about it and now we have almost the whole system. And now I have something to teach for this next skill building ah, camp. Amazing. The thing is, I could say every name because all of them improves. Joseph is always the man. For me, he's the best technician in the world. Like 
he and Jason Rao are on top, but Joseph, man, he's something different. Why is he so good? Like everyone literally says how much of a good technician. Is it just his ability to take an information and just replicate it? Um, the thing is, he maybe f- thinks or not, even not, he's not replicating it. He's making it better. Like he, <laughs> he looks at something. Sometimes he thinks he's di- doing the same thing, but he's doing something else. So sometimes I can shine a little bit. Ah, eh, brother, you do it it's different. He's like, really? <laughs> but <laughs> most of the time, he's really aware of what he does and he does it just better. You can show him a technique and he will do it better. And this is the benefit of having a room that we have. We have great technicians. We have great, like Nicky Rod is such a strategist. You, you got, He's a technician and a strategist. Like you can talk uh, to people about strategy. You can talk to people about all of the positions. We have everything. And I think this was the magic of Hensos. It's not only Danaher. It's not only Gordon. It's all of them. Like there are people at Hensos, uh, for example, Nick Ronan. I think he was one of the pioneers with the rear triangle from the back. Like not many people know it. They know it from the instructionals, from John and Gordon. And they are like also the pioneers of it. But Nick Ronan is one of them. And they had so many great guys. And we have the same now. We have a great room. We can all troubleshoot together. And this is why I enjoy the time so much there. Because we are just going to different places in a short amount of time. So I call the room right now the room of spirit and time. You know what it is? No. No? It's a reference to Dragon Ball. There's a room, you go in there, one day pass in the real world, but you have one year in the room. (laughs) So it means you go out and you train for one year, but only one day passed. So this is how I describe (laughs) the B team room, if we are all coming together. How did did you find um, the addition of the the slope? The slope? The slope for CGI. The uh, pit. Oh, the pit. Uh, I love it. It's the best. It's, It's so good. Like when I look at tournaments now, like, for example, PJF, they do a great job. But I see in the comments all the time, get the pit, get the pit. It's so true, though. It? How much better is it? Like, there's no, there's no rolling out of bounds. There's none of that sort of, that's, that sort of shit. What do you guys think about it? It's great, right? Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think it's, I think it should just be a staple. I think most competitions now should do what they can to get a pit. <laughs> that's the truth of it. Yeah. Because it makes it more exciting. It makes it more exciting. And, and I think that, that pit, the best grappler will win and it's not you know there's not ways out you know if it it makes them you know even better wrestlers better guard players you know there's nowhere to go more exciting for people watching i don't i don't really see a negative no i don't think so we you know we we talked before but i think from a spectator point of view obviously no breaks in action is definitely a good thing um we were talking to victor hugo and he was giving his thoughts on it and he talked about obviously the the tactics around, you know, if you're kind of under threat, then you kind of back up and you can kind of go out of bounds to get the reset. And then there's a whole game around the reset and jostling for position. And obviously the decision that the referee makes could could kind of lean the match going one way or another. Um, yeah, I think obviously there's a safety factor as well. You're not off the mats onto the concrete as well. So there's no injuries. So it seems to be a number of benefits, as you said. I think, yeah, I think I, I'd like to see it in everything. Thank you, Seth Belial and Craig Jones. Like they changed the game. Yeah, yeah. I think they, I genuinely think they have. I think they yeah. have. I think, I think yeah, they've got. I think even like ADCC. Again, if they want to keep up with CGI, I think they've got to introduce a pit. I think they have because I, I just I don't think they will out of stubbornness out of just because CGI CGI have done it. But if they want it to be as good, they're gonna to have to step up and and go with the times. That's my opinion because watching ADCC compared to watching CJI wasn't it's not even the same spectacle it doesn't even feel like the same sport yeah know, because it's so many mats and it's yeah and I think you're going to see I think we spoke to um BMAC who runs uh PGF and he was saying that he thinks you're going to end up seeing a whole like in MMA where you get like the cage walking in the cage there's a whole game around that you're going to see probably similar with the ramp as well right like with Craig when he hit the flying <laughs> triangle that sort of stuff yeah, you're going to yeah, see that yeah. more and more so it's it's exciting to, to see the development of it as well I think for sure so that that's chat about um, I guess CJI and ADCC and the performance of the athletes yeah. and as their coach what your kind of reflections are on, on those performances people ask me all the time what are you do different mentally because your athletes seem like they're mentally in a good spot and stuff like that because John uh, Dana is talking about like there's no mental game it's all about technique because you're yeah. confident and stuff um, I tend to agree 
But what I try to do to make it as easy as possible for my students and athletes is to make them understand that the result doesn't matter at all. So it's good if you have a great performance. That's good. People will remember it. But even if you don't have a great performance, if you did everything coming up to the event, you can do more, right? So you should be happy about what you did regardless. So it doesn't matter if you win a milli or if you get eliminated the first round. In the end, it's all the same as long as you can truly say that you did everything that you can do. And I think this takes away the fear a bit more and then you can perform to your fullest. And I think everybody performed to their fullest except of Nikki, but Nikki was injured. Like half of the camp, like in the in the first half, he looked really good. After the fourth week, fifth week, he looked very, very good. But then Denise just, yeah, it was too much. So I hope he's doing the surgery. He still didn't do the surgery. Nikki, do the surgery, man. And then uh, he can do whatever. Like the ways of in jiu-jitsu for him are open. He can be a great coach. He can be a great athlete. He can be a great instructor. He can do whatever he wants to. So let's see where the way will bring him. And in, t- in terms of performance, again, everybody did amazing. Like I, I don't know anyone that didn't live up to what I thought they can do. But bro, Owen Jones, what, what the fuck? Owen, what are you doing? Like, what did he do with me? I was screaming like, like a little girl. Like, <laughs> I was screaming like, like a little girl. I think... Owen Jones is the future of the sport. I really think that he can be one of the greats in his division. And yeah, I can't wait to see what we will do in the future. Yeah, I think he yeah he looked great. And again, we spoke to him earlier about you know his performance and his reflections, and he was very happy. Obviously, he didn't get the result he wanted against Pato. And I fucked it up. It wasn't him. I oh, fucked really? up. Pato. I think so. How so? Uh, I had a different strategy for him going in, but then we got a little bit too excited, and. Someone told us that Pato is practicing uh, passing in the warm-up area. And I don't know why, but we were like, we can leg lock Pato. We can leg lock Pato. (laughs) And everybody was like, yeah, we will (laughs) leg lock Pato. And even if I think that Owen could do it, why go with the worst strategy possible? Like, why play into his strengths? I think if we would play another strategy, it would look different. So it's my mistake, not Owen's. But still... In the end, everything works out like it should be. And Owen can be one of the greats. Who knows? Maybe if he would win this ADCC, uh, he would party himself to death. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah. saying that earlier when he yeah. <laughs> so everything turned out pretty well, I would say. Yeah, okay. And I guess as a coach as well, obviously the, the camp's one thing, but obviously the competition day and, and everything else is, is different. I mean, you were very honest uh, there about kind of the mistake that you feel you made in regard to the approach to that match. Do you feel there's a lot of pressure on you as a coach to, to kind of make those decisions? No pressure at all because the results doesn't matter. I know that I did everything possible that I could and I know where I did my mistakes. As long as I can reflect, everything is good. So the pressure is only there if I believe that I have to prove something. And luckily, because... As a coach, it feels just natural to me. I don't know why. As an athlete, I was I was shaking the whole time. Like I, tournaments were pretty hard. That's why I did one every month just to get used to it. But as a coach, everything feels feels easier because I truly believe what in what I do. And I stand for no results matter as long as you do everything possible. And everybody did that, so we can all be proud of ourselves. No, it's it's it's, it's a great mindset. <laughs> Thinking about CGI though, because ADCC is one thing. I mean, and all of these things is obviously tomorrow is another day, right? There's always an opportunity to, to do these things again. But CGI, million pound pass, you know, it's hard to kind of ignore the result with that, right? Because it, it's massive and it's life changing if you win. You know, what one thing that I noticed with Nikki is, and I think we spoke to Jay about this, but I remember when he first broke onto the scene at ADCC, he was like a he was like a wild man. He was just you know, so emotionally charged. And then CGI was very calm, focused on his breathing and, and seemed to manage his, his emotions very well, despite the the, the size of, of the prize. I mean, how did you, you know, did you feel any different with CGI because of the amount of money that was on the line? Not really, yeah. not really. Um, <clears throat> again, in the end, if you look too much at the price, it can limit you. 
Mm. And I think Nicky Rod did an amazing job of yeah. not looking into it. And I pretty much do the same. And if we both are in the same spot that we understand, okay, we're just doing what we are here to do, it gets even easier and easier. Like if you surround yourself with the people that have the same goals as you, the same understanding as you, and we are just clicking, everything becomes easier. So it's like exponentially easier because of Nicky Rod. If he wouldn't be there, maybe I would have a little bit more stress. But luckily, it was like a, I was on autopilot like the three days. So I didn't have any pressure. And in the end, it doesn't matter. Like the people that want to see you fail will say it's bad regardless of the results. And the people that like you will always cheer you up. And in the end, even if you do the right things, the results can be bad. So for example, I could do all things wrong. Let's say Nicky Rod still wins. And then everybody says, oh, you did a great job. I wouldn't feel great with it because I didn't do the right thing. So everything comes to preparation. And if you can truly believe in that, the result is just the cherry on top. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And obviously you had ACCC and CJI, two different events, athletes across both, two different rule sets. So we just touched on obviously the, the pit and the wall. That's one thing. But obviously the actual scoring, the times, that all aside, I mean, we're, we're kind of going back a little bit now, but... How did you, what was your approach to, to kind of managing that in regard to having some guys doing, you know, the 10 minute match with the possibility of overtime with the the strange scoring and then obviously the, the free round and the 10 must scoring system? That was crazy, crazy. So I tried to merge both rule sets into the practice. I had to tell every individual which rule set they do because sometimes you have ADCC guys power with CGI guys. And sometimes I say we do CGI rule set. Sometimes I say we do ADCC rule set. Sometimes we do two, AD, uh, two CGI rounds and one ADCC round and the opposite. So I had to manage it one by one by one by one. And I had one timer and the timer was pretty much five minutes and a 30 second break. So instead of one minute for CGI, you had only 30 seconds. And the ADCC people, instead of five minutes, you have five minutes 30. So everybody has 30 seconds more to work or less of a break. And this is how I could manage it. So I call after every five minutes break in the CGI. After every five minutes and 30, I call CGI round two. And now we're in the points period of ADCC. Now we're in the overtime period of ADCC. And you have a regular round and a finals round. The regular round is 15 minutes to like with the 30 second break, 16 minutes, 30. And the finals are 25 minutes or 30 minutes for ADCC. So you see how complicated it gets. <laughs> I had to scream my lungs off every time. But I think it was pretty simple for them because they don't need to think. They hear round one, let's go. Round two, let's go. They hear the timer. But I had to stress, go left to right, tell everybody which rules that they are. That's why, for real, I got burnt out by the last week. I was thinking that everything is fine. I, it's easy peasy. But in the last week, I, I was a bit grumpy. So mm. I'm still recovering. And yeah, luckily we have about one year all the time until the next CJIs, if the next CJIs are happening. No, it's, it's a great solution to, to, to it. So yeah, well done. And um, you mentioned a couple of times that you were kind of planning for like future camps and that sort of thing. Um, obviously, we've not got ADCC now for a couple of years. Um, CJI possibly August next year, I think, but still remains to be seen. Um, I mean, what, what are your kind of plans with like camps and, and sort of coaching and that sort of thing at the moment? So obviously we have high level people, but understand that if you think, oh, their technique is perfect, they don't need to work on their technique, this is where you start to fail. Yeah, We always need to improve. Doesn't matter how much we think that we are pretty good at this or that, we always want to improve, okay? The sky's the limit. So... What I will do is go to B team two to three times in a year, do two to three camps. And depending on which tournaments are, we have skill camps, skill building camps and performance camps. So the next camp will be around March, April. And this is where we'll bring the system that Owen Jones gifted to me with what he did uh, in the preparation for CJI. And I believe this is a really, really good submission system. And I think that if the best people in the world and also the coming up best people like Nick Mataya and other great athletes in B-Team that are not known right now, if they come up with it, we can have a little advantage over the other people. 
So skill building is way more fun, more technique, less intensity, more volume, more positional rounds, fun. So I will try to spar with all of them. Also, because in the performance camp, I need to be sharp, no sparring. As a coach, you need to be there for everyone. You need to observe everything. You, I told you what I needed to do, so I can't spar. So what I did is I trained at night because I also want to improve, right? I have all the great people around me. I also want to be as good as possible. So this time I will try to sneak myself in into a position around with Jay or whatever. And hopefully <laughs> you guys can see it on YouTube. And yeah, it will be way more fun. And then we have one to two months. And after that, we have again that performance camp. If CGI 2 is happening, what I think will happen. And then we are back to hustling. But this time, only CGI rule set because ADCC is only every two years. But we have ADCC trials maybe coming up. So maybe it will be dual camp again. So I don't want to think about the skill camp, baby. This will be fun. Yeah, okay. And is that just for the, for the athletes? It's not going to be open to, to public or anything? Going to be open. Is it? Okay. Yeah, like... Even the performance camp, most of the time, not all of the time, people could come in. We had a full mat, like people enjoyed it. So think about this in jiu-jitsu. We have a sport where you can train alongside of the best people in the sport. And you can talk to them. You can even sometimes roll with them. So this is why beating is so great. You can just come in there, drop your fee and train with them. And yeah, what's more beautiful than that if you love the sport? Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's great. I think having that open door policy, I think... I guess you need to be careful to some degree with, with maybe strangers, with, you know, sort of creepy crawlies on the skin and, and maybe going in there trying to uh, snipe people. Um, but I think outside of that, it's, it's great. Good, good luck sniping some of them. Well, this is it, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what yeah. I mean? Man, it, it only takes one guy that jumps on you. Yeah. It doesn't even need to be good. Yeah. One jump and it could be difficult. Yeah. Uh, is there a concern about that? Having that sort of open door policy where people can come in and train and drop the fee? Is there is a concern that some idiot might come in who's, you know, I don't know, 120 kilos and he does something dumb and injures somebody? Yeah, uh, always, always. But that's the thing. I will not let them spar with the good guys yeah, okay. if, if they are like, the, like, I try to observe everybody. First of all, we have rules. And if you violate the rules, you're out. So if I see someone spazzing around, for example, the thing is, this is why I have the heart rate training there. If I say low heart rate and I see someone spazzing, I already know who's the troublemaker. <laughs> and then, okay. we can, then we can do something about it. Yeah. Because if you just roll without, like, without the condition of having a low heart rate, medium or high, you can spaz out, you can freak out. But if I say low heart rate, I see you, you're going crazy. Okay, got it. If I say high heart rate and you're not going crazy, I see, oh, you're a bit lazy, right? You're a bit lazy. So this will be not great for the performance. And yeah, this is originally how I came up with the tool because I teach fundamentals. So to beginners and white belts, and the biggest problem that you uh, encounter as an instructor with white belts is that they're going too hard. If you go too hard, you have two issues. One, injuries, and two, you can't learn because in order to learn, you need to think or you will only get good at things that are natural for you, so talent, or the skills that you already have. You will not develop new skills. So what I do is I tell them, okay, we do this in a low heart rate. I explain what the low heart rate is. And every time I see someone spazzing out, they are tired because they're beginners. So then we are all laughing at them. We are all laughing together. And after that, nobody's doing it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was going to ask about the heart rate thing. I'm glad you brought it up because we, uh, yeah, we, we've commented a couple of times when you were sort of getting on Nikki, Nikki Ryan's case about his heart rate. Yeah. But it's, it's, yeah, so it's a great approach. And this is where I love that kind of incorporation of sports science to, to sort of a, a martial art or a combat sport training room. So I think it's really fascinating. And, and do you wear that all the time or is it just when you're doing sort of the performance rounds and stuff? Uh, you mean with the heart rate? Yeah. Um, I want to do it for all the rounds that we know which heart rates we have to have. Yeah. Just because of the goals. Every round that we do has a goal. So either you want to peak up in your performance or you want to develop a skill or you want to sharpen a skill. There's no round where you can just fuck around. If you want a round to fuck around fuck around but this is low heart rate because you can only fuck around in a low heart rate if you are high how can you fuck around so every round has a purpose and the more you know how you should feel the easier you can get to the goal of the round yeah okay and uh, what devices do you use out of interest the thing is even if you go low heart rate sometimes it's showing 
are pretty high in yeah. jiu-jitsu just because it's more physical. So the heart rates are more for you to think and understand your body. Mm. Low just means you can go all day and you can think. Medium means you you can still think, but not completely. And highest, you can't think. You are just doing it. I personally uh, have a whoop. Mm -hmm. I just play around with it, but you don't need to whoop because it will always show it up a bit higher, but you can still track if you are in zone five for 10 minutes or only for one minute, then you know how hard you're going. Yeah, okay. And if the other guys are wearing devices that you're monitoring, are you, do you have that on like a, look at the, how are you seeing that? Normally, I don't look at it. I see if you go low, medium right, or okay, high. okay, fine. But with Nicky Rod, I wanted to sh I wanted him to show it to me. <laughs> so so sometimes I ask the people come come closer show me the heart rate. With Ethan and Nicky Rod specifically, these two because they are going so hard all the time. Not anymore. I think they are they are now really good with monitoring it. Hmm. But this is where I, I will be like give, <laughs> give me your heart rate. Just just give it to me. And Nicky Rod for example, one time he sent it to me, I'm a beast, bro, because he was 30 minutes in hard zone five. This is impossible. <laughs> <What> <laughs> how, yeah, yeah, how can you do 30 that? 30 minutes at five? Yeah, I made him spar four people in a row. Like one after the other, after the other. Not rounds, but after every submission or after every minute. He loved it. <laughs> they is, hated that it. That is wild, isn't it? But they, when we're speaking to Jay, like those brothers, they live so clean, don't they? They were saying about like, you know, they eat perfect pretty much. They only drink water. They they don't even drink coffee, you know, and it's just, you can see why they're such athletes. Yeah. Because they live a certain way. That's what I mean. They are machines. You tell them something, they do it. If they think that anything can improve their performance, they will do it. So It's inspiring though, isn't it? It's inspiring. When he was sat here talking about that, I was thinking, I'm so ill-disciplined compared to that. <laughs> <laughs> But I think I think growing up wrestling has got to play a part. Must it? Because I think if you're growing up wrestling and you know you're going to those practices, you've got a coach and it's a combat sport. And obviously, you know the coach maybe was quite good if they've if they've instilled those values in in their in their life in their lifestyle. Yeah. So I think that has a massive play on it. Surely, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, chatting to Ethan, he, he, I'm sure he wasn't entirely, but he joked about the fact that he was basically just stoned up until 19 years old and then decided to do some combat sports. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, maybe not that same kind of influence or growing up perhaps, who knows? But yeah, no, it's, it's fascinating, mate. And it, it, it sounds like you've got such a, a very sort of well thought out, structured, evidence-based like approach to training. So it's, uh, yeah, it's very clear why it's so effective. So Thank it's you. awesome. You mentioned, um, and I, I think I know what your answer is going to be, but you mentioned obviously the system you're developing. Can you give us any kind of clues a, around what that might look like? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thing is, I'm pretty bad with not showing what I'm passionate about. Yeah. So I have a seminar every weekend and somehow I end up showing it to people because I'm doing it, right? And they're like, what was this? Like, let me show you a little bit, just a little <laughs> bit. Uh, like at our Portugal camp, with me, Owen, and PJ Barge. Like, I explained it to PJ, and we talked about it, and Owen is just looking at me from the side. <laughs> because we should show it. We should. Yeah. But, yeah, it, it has something to do with uh, submissions. That's, <laughs> <laughs> I will show it to you later in the okay. seminar. I will All show right. it to you later. Fine. And with CJR and ADCC, the rule sets, which do you prefer out of interest? Which, which brings out the best performance? We talked again about the pit versus the map, but in regard to the actual rule set and the scoring, what do you think has the best um, yeah, promotion of, of display of technique? Display of technique, definitely CJI. Because in ADCC, it's more physical. The camp for CJI will be completely different than the one for ADCC. In ADCC, you need to... The thing is, what decides the ADCC matches is often not the jiu-jitsu, but what is around the jiu-jitsu. Like the hand fight around it, before you engage, how you disengage, how sweaty you are. In CJI, it's the opposite. The jiu-jitsu will determine the winner. Mm. Yeah, okay, nice. And what are the common mistakes that you maybe think when you look around that maybe coaches might might make when they're trying to develop athletes that might sort of, yeah, stifle the, the development of the, the people they're working with? Yeah, two things. Number one, distinguishing what an instructor and a coach is. Because if you're an instructor, it doesn't mean that you're a coach. You need to distinguish this. Number two, being more open-minded. So what Robert is, what I try to be, what Bruce Lee was, open-minded. We take 
that what works. And this is always my philosophy. If I see a random guy that's not even training jujitsu coming up with something and can prove to me that his idea is better than mine of training, why shouldn't we immediately do it? So I don't care who the person is. If he can bring me the evidence and I accept it, but I can only do it if I'm open-minded. And also I struggle with it. Every human struggles with it to like not being open-minded enough and sticking with what we believe in. It's sometimes hard in politics and the relationship, in the friendships, in jujitsu. But yeah, we just can try to be as open-minded as possible and also ask ourselves if we are what we think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. And we're, we're kind of wrapping up in a second, because we've got a seminar to get to soon. But is there anything you want to talk about? Have you got any future plans? Uh, any other ideas that you want to share to the audience? The thing is, right now I'm concerned with the system for the skill building camp. And after that, I need to structure this, or not structure, I need a good seminar schedule because uh, I'm off the place there. Um, not not much, to be fair. Like just focusing on um, bringing the athletes to their goals as soon and as good as possible. And yeah, figuring out the seminar and everything situation because I'm always a bit on the road and i don't know when i can do what so if you guys are interested in seminars ask right now rather than when i'm in b team again and the socials blow up and check out my patreon because i have crazy good stuff on there for 30 bucks a month come on that's mm -hmm. a good deal and any sponsors or anything you want to shout out uh yeah shout out to Rollbless. um pretty solid gear i especially like the geese to be fair so i'm still waiting for my gi even <laughs> though i do no gi uh the most times and yeah shout out to b team like shout out to bjj academy i can't wait to be back and see all the guys awesome dima that's been a really interesting conversation mate loads of good information thank you for coming on my friend thank you man cheers man, cheers, man.